Good morning. It's so good to see all of you. I welcome all of you, and I wish all of the women a happy Mother's Day. Uh, we do have some announcements. They are in the back, in case you don't uh, get what I'm saying. Uh, we would appreciate all of you signing the uh, friendship reg register and passing it to the end of the row. Uh, and if you have a new email address or any change in your address, would you please make that uh, known in the register? The college group will meet tonight at 6 o'clock at the Ingersoll's at, for an end of the year pre finals cookout. And please consider signing a, a Tomoda lawn. Uh, the schedule is posted on the bulletin board outside the parlor kitchen. Uh, and May is our month to stock the shelves for loaves and fishes, so please consider signing up for that uh, as much as you can help. Uh, the schedule is posted on the bulletin board outside the parlor kitchen. And Disciples Women are selling tickets this morning for ladies' night out uh, before and after worship today. So if you can uh, go to that, uh, please uh, buy your ticket. Will you join with me in the call to worship? That's right. I knew I'd mess it up. And now will you join with me in the call to worship. Be pleased, O God, to deliver me. Let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. The opening hymn is uh, number five.
Will you pray with me the invocation? Good morning, Lord. We give you our thanks and praise for the beauty of this day. We thank you for the many ways you reveal yourself and invite us to participate in your resurrection activities every day. Accept the worship we lift to you today. Amen. talking to this? Okay. I was looking for an on and off switch. Good morning. I think, you think we might have some more? We are going to have more. Okay. All right. Well, we'll just wait for him. And while we're waiting for him, Today is a special day, isn't it? Of course, Sunday's always a special day, right? Why is Sunday a special day? <laughs> Let me get up here close enough so we can all hear. Good morning. Wow. Good morning. Can I get on your face? All right. Good morning. We have everybody here, maybe now. You know what? We just ask everybody to. Sundays are always special. Why are Sundays special? special. Yes, you are special. <laughs> Do you know why Sundays are special? Talk about our Savior. We come to church because it's the Lord's day, and it's our day. It's supposed to be our day of rest, where we can worship God and learn about God and Jesus. Today is another, it's, we have an extra special Sunday today because it's also something else. Mother's Day. You bet. Now, I had a lot of fun. I, I think most of, many of you know, anyway, that I've had in children's church or Sunday school, that I used to teach school. And I had a lot of fun with Mother's Day because we would write stories about our mothers. Well, we're not going to write a story today, but we might share the same thing that we would have written down in a story. But I need your help. So I'm going to start a sentence, and I want you to finish it. Okay? So if I said, well, let me tell you. Well, look. Yeah. Well, hang on just a minute. My mother is no longer here. My mother's in heaven. But my mother was funny. If I said to you, my mother is, what would you say? My mother is what? Helpful. Good. Kind. Loving. Anybody else? My mother is what? What is your mother? Good. Is your mother nice? Mm -hmm. All right. My mother is nice. <clears throat> what if I said, my mother likes to, my mother used to like to go camping. So you think about your mother. My mother likes to what? What would you say? Crochet. Anybody else think of something your mother likes to do? Help. Good. Anybody? You know what your mother likes to do? Um. Help me clean up. Help me clean up. All right. <laughs> she doesn't like, my mother didn't like snakes. Now, how about, <laughs> how about your mother? My mother doesn't like spiders, bears. My mother doesn't like bears? Okay. Anything else? My mother doesn't like. 
Okay. My mother doesn't like Alligators, okay. <laughs> My mother is the prettiest when... My mother was the prettiest when she got ready to go to work. Can you think of when your mother is the prettiest? My mother. Yeah. Is your mom pretty all the time? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> Nobody knows. Nobody has an answer for that one. You know when your mother's the prettiest. Okay, maybe it's all the time. I like it when she does what? <laughs> I like it when she, I used to like it when my mother would spend time with me. Anybody has anything special that you like to do with your mom? I like it when she takes me shopping. <laughs> Toys. Gets you toys. All right. All right. Why are mothers so special? Why are they so good to us? They can help us in our journey of safety. Why do they do that? Because they love us. Exactly. Would you say that your mothers are so special and they're so good because they love you? That makes me think of someone else. Who do we talk about at church all the time that thinks we're special and loves us? God and Jesus. Exactly. And one of the things Jesus told the disciples and told us is that we should love one another the way he loved us. I think mothers do that, don't you? Yeah. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for our mothers. Help us to remember that Jesus told us to love one another just as he loved us. Help us to be more like Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You. Now, there we go. Many of you will not necessarily know who this is. Every once in a while, she comes in with children and then sneaks off away. But on your bulletin cover, you have been reading the name Brandy Collins for um, almost two years. A little over two years. A little over two years. And so here she is today, standing before you, finished with school. On um, Friday, she finished her student teaching, and we celebrate that with her, but we mourn the fact that that's going to take her away from us. She is uh, going to be moving home to Iowa and um, looking for a job. If anybody knows anybody who's looking for a great elementary school teacher, we know of a great candidate, don't we? We have seen her um, with our children, and we have seen her especially with Alexis over the course of these last two years and that special relationship that you've built with her. Um, we just want you to know that we are so excited for your future. We grieve your leaving us, but we are so excited for a very bright and wonderful future. We will be praying that you will find just the right job, hopefully close by so you can come back and work for us. <laughs> And, uh, and so as a congregation, we just have a gift of appreciation, and we just wanted to say thank you and celebrate these last two years. Shall we? So um, after church, if you want to stop by the nursery and um, wish Brandy well, you should do that because she'll be there with the kids. So um, after that, maybe you could stop back through by the parlor. So maybe parents can rush off um, during. Why don't we do that? Parents, why don't you go get your children um, during the closing hymn? And then that way, uh, yeah. then we could celebrate.
with Brandy in the parlor after church today. Okay? All right. Thanks, kids, for coming up. We will see you after Children's Church. You heard that sweet voice earlier say, I want to go to the nursery, right? (laughs) That's because Brandy does such a great job. Special music. This is the last week of having our choir with us and our interns who have served um, so well. I'm going to ask all four interns to stand up at this time. We want to thank you. And since we're having Brandy stay after service over in the parlor, why don't you guys make your way to the parlor and just hang out for a few minutes today too. And you can come by and say thank you personally to them as well. So thank you again for a great year and for um, being part of a great choir and maybe even being the backbone of that choir. We appreciate you so very, very much. Thank you. You can be seated. I would share with you the concerns and celebration of our congregation as we know them at this time. Many of you know that we celebrated the life of Gene Johnson Moore on Friday, and uh, that was here in the sanctuary. We had the burial in Chapin, Illinois. I had been to Chapin, Illinois. I just didn't know it. Have you ever been to towns you just didn't realize you had been to that town? So um, uh, we celebrated that with her family. The flowers that have been in the sanctuary, that are in the sanctuary, are from her memorial service. And we just are thankful for a life well lived. 
a, a saint in our congregation, really, someone who served as Elder Stephen Minister and many, many other jobs. And uh, she was one that I would call on to go to the hospital if for some reason I couldn't and we had someone in need. She had a gift to be at the bedside of someone. And uh, so we just, we miss her. We've been missing her because she's been gone for a few months in Iowa living with her daughter. And, and we will continue to keep her memory alive in our heart here in this church. Heard from Sue Cooper this morning via email. And uh, they are home, but they've been back and forth to the emergency room and to the hospital for many different reasons, um, especially platelets. They're there this morning, I believe, getting more platelets. They will uh, travel to St. Louis again tomorrow for more uh, treatment and um, biopsies, just checking to make sure that the cancer is doing what we hope it is and being gone. And so uh, there will still be a few more treatments, but by next Tuesday, that should all be done, we're hoping. And so we keep um, Jean and Sue both in our prayers as they continue to fight this, this, um, this battle. Judy Graves asked for prayers for her son-in-law, Derek. His mother, Shirley Highland, um, passed away on Monday, and so we keep your family in our thoughts, Judy. Myrna Osborne is um, recovering well. I tried to reach her last week, but did not, but I've talked to her each of the subsequent weeks before, and she uh, seems to be doing well in her recovery, and uh, hope to have her back here in Macomb in the first week of June is what I'm hearing. Ellen Tingley will have minor surgery on Friday in Bloomington. We keep you in our thoughts, Ellen. Uh, we mentioned Glenn last week, and um, he gave me a report, and things seem to be going pretty well. And so, Glenn, we keep you in our thoughts. Welcome back, Barb. You weren't here last week, but welcome back from your winter away. Jealous, very jealous, but we're glad you're back. Don and Carly Smith, we continue to keep in our prayers as well as T Teresa Munir. Um, Joe Munir's sister, Brianna Cardle. Um, Brenda? Okay had a dog bite and then got a staph infection that has turned um, rather serious. And so we keep Brenda, sorry, I, I wrote that down wrong earlier today. I'm sorry, Joe. Um, we keep Brenda in our prayers. And Jim Schauble also had um, surgery this week. It's home and progressing. And so all of these folks we know about, there are many folks that we don't know about. And there are many things going on in the world that we need to continue to keep in our prayers. I skipped over a name. Looking at the Chattertons, I re realized I skipped over Jason Stewart's name. Jason Stewart's um, health is declining um, rapidly, and so let's keep Jason Stewart and his family in our prayers. With all of this in our mind and in our hearts, let us just center ourselves on God. Let us breathe, and let us come to God in prayer. great and gracious God, for all these we have named, for those who have been left unnamed but are in our hearts and in our minds, we lift these people to you, grateful that your spirit can come into this place and be with each of us individually, be with us corporately. We turn to that spirit to help us to know of your presence in difficult times. We're hopeful that the way we live can help others know of your presence, to help others to know of the peace that Jesus preached, to know the love that he showed. May we bring your peace. May we show your love. We gather this day that is special, even holy to us, this day where we celebrate moms, mothers, 
for many of us, this is a great day. A great day to remember the good things that our moms have done for us, the great ways that our moms have taken care of us. To remember that in Genesis, you say that you have created us all in your image, both male and female. And so this day, we celebrate moms created in your image, and we celebrate the way that you come to us, God, the way that you nurture us, the way that you care for us, the way that you show your love and small and even large ways. That even as we celebrate such good memories and such good times, we recognize that for some, this day is hard. A relationship that has not been so ideal. Difficulty in becoming a mom. For those who hear the day Mother's Day and cringe instead of smile, we ask for your help for your love and care to come. We give thanks that we can bring our joys to you and even our concerns and know that you will attend to us. So this day as we come to worship, whether we are in the midst of joy or something less than joyful, we look to you We expect you to meet us. Give us the strength we need this day, God, to be your people, to be your people in this world, to serve you well as you always serve us. So on this Mother's Day, we lift this prayer to you in the name of the Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's difficult for me to let the Sunday go with the interns and not mention them. We have two uh, who sang for you this morning. Um, Mariah stood in for someone who sang with James on his recital and did a wonderful job with that. Well, you know that Tad is going to be around because he is our youth children's minister, and uh, I think you'll see him again. James Anders, James. Apologize again. James Flaherty. Why do I always do that? I don't know. James Flaherty is going to be in the area next year and may be singing with us. Uh, we, we can only hope he's going to be student teaching in the, in the spring next year. Julie Winter is also going to be around next year, and we're trying to convince her that maybe she wants to be back here. Mariah is a master teacher. She's going to be student teaching in Rock Ridge with a friend of mine, Curtis Fisher Oslinger. And uh, she's very, very excited. You might be able to tell that by looking at her face. She has also helped with transitions. We have a strange face, uh, a lovely face in the choir. (laughs) Mia Iliopoulos is a name you may want to get to know. Please stand up a minute. (laughs) Mia is going to be an intern with us next year in the choir and also doing the children's and youth choirs. So welcome her also. In addition to those four interns and this new intern, the rest of the choir, all of these people behind me have made an offering with their talents every week for the enhancement of our worship service. And so I dedicate the anthem this morning offering to them.
absolutely beautiful as always. Thank you so much for your work this year. And um, rest up the vocal cords. August is coming. Thank you. That was a, uh, a song written by a good friend of mine from Nashville, so that was wonderful to hear. And what I'm really hoping is that the voice inside your head isn't saying, I'd like to go to the nursery and play. <laughs> I'm hoping that you're excited for the word today, just as you've been excited to celebrate ministries and to hear the choir. This is an important word that we will hear this day. Let us hear it. As we start in Acts 10, verses um, 1 through 8. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort. As it was called, he was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about 3 o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He answered, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. Our sermon title today, The Importance of Cornelius, I don't know where that came from. I think it came from a play. Have you ever heard of the play, The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde? I just thought it was a fun play. The importance of Cornelius, and if you hold on to that I, Elias, the syllables match for the importance of being earnest. So I thought it was fun, but I'd never really known anything about the importance of being earnest, the play. Hopefully we all know something about being a little earnest, solemn, serious. It was Oscar Wilde's last play. Did you know that? I did not know that. It was his last play, and it was about two men, um, one named John Worthing, who in the country had a friend named Algernon. Algernon has a cousin named Gwendolyn, and John is in love with Gwendolyn, and he wants to marry her. And s this is the problem. He's been lying. He's been saying that his name, for whatever reason, he's been saying that his name is Ernest. He's been telling everybody in the countryside, my name is Ernest. Hello, hello. Hi, Gwendolyn. I've fallen in love with you, but my name is actually not Ernest. He doesn't want to say that. But he has a cigarette case that has his real name on it. And so Al, as I will call him, will not let them get married until he understands why. And so the ruse is up. And so he finally tells Algernon, this is, this is why. This is what happens in the city. This is who I am. But here, this is who I am. And, and Algernon says, well, you know what? I have some silly things that happen with me too. Because I lie and tell people I'm going to visit someone that I'm not going to go visit, but I just need some time away. So these two men who have found each other as good friends, who have ruses that they keep up from time to time, go to the house where Gwendolyn is and her mother, Lady Bracken. Algernon takes her away while John, pretending to be earnest, asks for Gwendolyn's hand in marriage. She says yes, and one of the reasons she says yes, remember this is a comedy, the reason she says yes is because she likes his name. Ernest. Your name is Ernest, I'll marry you. This is pretty much what is, is taking place through a series of events. We find out that um, Ernest slash John is not good wedding material. He wasn't raised right. He shouldn't be at the same social stature as Gwen. And so he is declined her hand, but they still want to get married. The name Ernest gets 
thrown around a lot. John even swears that he's going to go to the priest and the priest is going to officially rename him Ernest. Algernon starts to use the name Ernest, falls in love, gets engaged. Also, that woman likes the name Ernest. The final scene is a scene where we find out that, that, that Ernest, John, is actually of the same social class through a series of events where he was accidentally left by a nanny at a train station in a purse. (laughs) That nanny was still working for the family. They find out that he is okay. He can get married and everything is great. And Lady Bracken says, he turns out to be her nephew, by the way, She says, oh, my nephew, you seem to have uh, be involved in a life of triviality. And he says, oh, my great aunt, for the first time in my life, I understand the need to be earnest. That's probably paraphrased. But this double entendre of the word, the woman that he loves, loves that name, so he wants to be earnest, but... The verb, to be more serious, to be more solemn, to take life in a different way than he had been taking life. He wants to live earnestly from that point on. Well, the man, Cornelius, is earnest. The man, Cornelius, that we read about today is an earnest man. He isn't in the faith, you understand. He's a Roman centurion. He's not in the faith, but he sees the faith, and he sees good things in this faith, which is Jewish. And so he tries to live his life in a way where he's constantly praying to God, and he's giving to people who are poor. We read about what has happened. That gets recognized by God, and God sends an angel who says, it's okay, You need to understand things a a little more still. So I want you to go find this guy. His name is Simon, Peter. He may not know Cornelius. He may not know that Simon Peter is the rock upon which Jesus is going to build the church. He may not understand everything just yet, but he will. So he sends the men to Joppa. Peter is in Joppa at Simon the Tanner's house by the seaside. And he's up on the roof, which would have been flat. And he's praying. And he has this weird dream. Cornelius had a dream. Peter now has a dream, a vision, if you will. A sheet coming down from heaven with four animals on it. Now, Peter is of the faith. Peter grew up in the Jewish faith, so he understands what is right and what is appropriate and what is clean and what is unclean, what is sacred, what is profane. The sheet is dropping from heaven, and it has all these animals on it. And, and, and the voice of God says, Peter, rise up, kill, and eat. And Peter says, no, God, I have never eaten anything that was profane or unclean and the voice responds what god has made clean you shall not call profane what god has made clean you shall not call profane this vision occurs three times and then suddenly the sheet is lifted up to heaven and peter is left to try to figure it out He's wondering what it could all mean when there's a knock on the gate and three men have arrived and they have a story to tell about a Roman centurion named Cornelius. While the knocking is going on, Peter's standing there in his wonderment and the voice comes to him again and says, go to the gate. These men are here for you. Do whatever they ask. So the next day, Peter gathers some of his friends some of his Jewish friends who also at this point now believe in Jesus. Not all the Jews did. Surely you know that. 
Surely you know that at about the same time that Peter is starting to help build the church, there's conflict with the temple leaders who don't believe in Jesus, who don't believe in his message, who don't believe him to be the Messiah. It wasn't all nice and rosy. There were arguments and there were wars and there were battles. This is the beginning of that time. So Peter gets up, gets up with his friends and they go with these three men to Caesarea. And when they come in the door to Cornelius' house, there are lots of people gathered. And Peter stands up in the midst of all of these people and says, You know that it is unlawful for a Jew like me to come into a room full of Gentiles like you. I'm not supposed to be able to do that. I'm not supposed to be able to come and visit you like this. But God has made it known to me that there are no profane people. I want you to hear that again. The one upon whom the church is supposed to be built on gets a message from God that says, no one is profane. We should celebrate that. Too often we think of ourselves in difficult ways. Too often we set ourselves outside the realm of God's love. Too often we set other people outside the realm of God's love. Sometimes we come to this table and we don't think we're worthy. My friends, we're worthy because God has said in the book of Acts, in the 10th chapter, through the apostle Peter, there are no profane people. That's something we should remember more often. That no matter who we are, God comes to us. No matter what other people might say about us or say to us, God says, I love you. Come to me. You know that needs to be celebrated, right? Cornelius says to Peter, this is what happened in my dream. This man came to me and said these good things, said that I was known by God. These works that I've been doing, this praying that I've been doing, that these things were noticed So I sent for you as I was instructed, and, and Peter says, well, that's a great thing. Let me tell you about one part of this faith that maybe you don't know. Have you heard of this guy, Jesus? He said these things. He said that he was bringing peace. He lived his life in such a way that we could come to know God, and he was killed and buried and resurrected, and in him we find this hope. We find this love. One of the commentators that I read calls this the Gentile Pentecost. We're reading these stories in Acts these, these few weeks leading up to the Pentecost where Jews were gathered from all over the place and spirit came to them and tongues of fire landed on them and people who couldn't even understand each other talking were able to talk with each other. There was a spiritual experience where Peter gets up and gives a sermon. Well, in the midst of this sermon that Peter is giving to these Gentiles, these non-Jews, these people who were considered by the establishment as unclean, as profane, not able to be a part of them, the Spirit is poured out. The Spirit is poured out over all of these unbelievers. Jesus' friends are amazed that the Holy Spirit of God could be poured out on uncircumcised believers, on people who weren't Jewish. And Peter says, can we withhold baptism? Is there any reason why these folks can't be baptized? They have found the Spirit. They are part of us. 
God says, there are no profane. God says, all are welcome. God says, come unto me. And so they're baptized. And they're believers. And Peter stays for a few more days in Caesarea to teach and to preach and to help them grow in their faith. The importance of Cornelius for us is that we're invited, my friends. We're not Jewish. But we are invited. We've been called into this faith. We, we, we follow in the ways of the one whom we say we are disciples. We follow the Christ and God's love can come to us. This moment in Acts may be more important to us as Gentile folks than the Pentecost. I'd never thought about that until I reread this story. I'd read this story before, but it hit me in a different way. Without this Gentile Pentecost, without this opening up of the Spirit on those who weren't supposed to be in We might not be sitting here. Oh, probably God would have found a way. I hope in that, that God would have found a way that we could come to know God's love, that we could come to know unconditional love, that we could know divine friendship. I'm expecting that God would have come to us to say, hey, you're not unclean, you're holy. Because you're mine. I'm expecting that God would have done that. The other part of this is that Peter had to be transformed. You hear him saying from that original dream, I have never eaten anything that was unclean or profane. Comes into the meeting, I've never been in a place where there were this many Gentile people before me. He had to be transformed. God had to come to him and say, listen, you followed Jesus and you've gotten a lot of things right, but I need you to understand there's this one more thing that I need you to, to do. There's this one more thing that I need you to teach and preach. I need you to understand, Peter, it's not all for just one group of people. My love and my grace are for all. Preach that. Teach that. Help this Roman centurion know that. In his book called Be Holy, Brian Christopher Coulter writes these words. <laughs> to be holy... Is not, to be a, is not to be set apart from everything. To be holy is to be set apart from the unholy and set apart with the holy. Set apart with all that is holy. Set apart with all who are holy. Set apart with one another. Set apart together. Set apart as members of the one body. Set apart with all the saints, with all that is consecrated, with all that is sanctified. We are set apart to be connected, to discover our interdependence, and to find belonging. We are the saints. We are joined together. We are built together. We grow, we are called to grow into holiness together. He writes, be holy. Find belonging. God says, you belong. You belong. Just because of who I am, you belong. Understand that together. Live that together. How different would our world look if we could remember that we are all holy and sacred and God's.
Tony Campolo shares the story of graduation day at Eastern University in Pennsylvania, that at one point in their graduation ceremony, one student would be invited up to share about his or her experience in being in college and to give thanks for those who had made it possible for his or her education. One year, a, a very bright young woman, says Campolo, got up to speak. And she began to talk about her father, who was very conservative in his religious and political views. She began to say that, as I came to college, Dad, it became harder and harder to come home. Because every time we talked about anything that the government should be doing or anything that the church should be doing, we seemed to be butting heads. Our political ideologies no longer matched. But I grew up, God, uh, Dad, I grew up, Dad, in your ways. We used to agree on everything. But now... It's to the point where I don't even want to come home. We can hardly have a conversation. People in the audience were getting upset because this was that speech that's supposed to be saying, thank you to all those who provided for my education and especially my parents. And here she is embarrassing her father. Here she is talking about disagreement. Tony says there was a, a, a complete reversal in a moment. She said, but with all of that, Dad, whatever I do, whatever I become, it's all your fault. Because you are the most compassionate person I know, and in I, when I was young, you taught me compassion. You taught me compassion. So whatever my religious views may be, whatever my political views may be, they start from a heart of compassion, which you taught to me. And for that, I am ever grateful. And even though we may not see eye to eye, I know compassion because of you. So whoever I am, Whoever I am to become. Thanks, Dad. There's no way that we will all agree on everything. But the example of Peter says to us that all are welcome, no matter who you are. All are welcome, no matter your political agenda, no matter your religious views. All are welcome. We call ourselves disciples of Christ. But we follow in the footsteps of the original disciples like Peter. Let us listen to this story in Acts. Let extend our hands to the Corneliuses of this world who will cross our path. Let us live our lives in such a way that others will come to know of the grace and love of God. This is our call. This is the path we are to take. Let's be thankful and joyful for it. In the name of the Christ. Amen.
Please be seated as we gather around the table. This is the time in the service where we turn our attention totally to God, where we come into this place where we know that the spirit of the living God will fall afresh on us. We come to this table to find our rest. We bring our joys. We bring our concerns. We find our peace. So let us share this holy communion today as a family in God, knowing God's presence is the one who invites us to the table in the first place. Shall we pray? Spirit of the living God, bless this loaf, the bread of heaven. And as we partake of it, may we remember Jesus giving it to his disciples in the upper room uh, at the Last Supper. And today we receive it. And we also receive your blessing of uh, inheriting eternal life if we but believe. Dear Father, we uh, thank you for giving us strength to meet the uh, temptations that come before us. And we pray that you will give us uh, faith so that we may meet the uh, challenges and the trials that come to us in everyday life. Thank you, dear Lord, for all of your teachings. And we pray that we may live so that those who do not know you will want to have these blessings of your love and mercy. We give, these, uh, give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. God of all wisdom and power, we are nothing without you, but in you we can do so much. Jesus Christ is the vine, and we are the branches. As we drink this wine, the product of the vine, help us remember the true wine, Jesus Christ. Let his love flow within us as we extend our thoughts with us and we might bear the fruit of the Christian life. Amen. When Jesus sat at the table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. And after the meal, he took wine and he blessed it. And he poured it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my blood poured out for you. Each time you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, remember me. Let us remember the one who brought peace. Let us remember the one who brings all to God. Let us know that all are invited to share in this communion. Let us share now.
Each of us has a talent to serve our Lord in some way. I learned about that early in life, how I might help out in a little country church where I grew up. Whoever got there first in the winter time built the fire, and we huddled around the uh, big heater and visited some until it got warm. Different families volunteered to clean the church as needed. We gathered sometimes to do painting and repair and, asked, and always brought a lunch to share. I always thought that was so much fun. We had a schedule for preparing communion. Each family took a turn. When it was our turn, my mother baked the bread and my sister and I washed the communion cups. We liked to do that. And I can remember the pasteboard box, the big pasteboard box, uh, where uh, the trays were kept. And uh, each uh, Sunday uh, after the service, another family took the, the box home to bring it back the next uh, Sunday. I took piano lessons, and my first performance in public was playing hymns for the service. Uh, we did not have a regular minister, so it was up to the families of the church to keep things going. We always entertained the minister and his wife when there were special meetings, and we did have those once in a while. I was baptized in the Mount Sterling Church Baptistry, where we later attended when New Salem could no longer continue. New Salem was on the Camden Road between Camden and Mount Sterling, so it's not the old New Salem church that was out here at uh, Adair. Those were good days, and I am thankful my great-grandfather helped to organize that church. My father was an elder, and my mother taught the Sunday school classes always. We always had a Christmas program, and children performed and were given treats. We did not have a very big budget, but each gave what he could because those were depression days. Serving in different ways to keep the church going is what we had to do, and we did it gladly. God has asked us to share our talents or ways of serving as well as our financial blessings. We may prepare communion emblems. We may share our singing voices. We may be greeters at one of the entrances. We may help someone who has needs during the week. We may prepare food for a church function or share food for loaves and fishes. We may make a visit or make a phone call to someone who is ill. We may serve on a committee to carry on the business of the church. And you can think of other ways. We all can share and should invite others to be a part of our fellowship uh, as we share the love of Christ. At this time, we will give our monetary gifts. May it be pleasing to God what we share. May we also remember that he is thankful when we serve in other ways.
thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege to share our time, our love, and our finances. May these offerings be used to your glory. In thy name we pray. Amen. We come to that time in the service where we recognize we all have gifts. We're all invited to use those gifts. And if anyone would like to use those gifts as a member of First Christian Church, we invite you to come forward as we sing our closing hymn. This is an opportunity for all of us, though, to recommit and commit ourselves to our faith, to go and live as disciples of the Christ in this world, to bring peace and love to a world that desperately needs it. So as we sing our closing hymn, let us make such promises. Our hymn is number 433, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Please be seated. We have some exciting news today. This is Stephen Gemming, if you'll turn and face this way. We have had Stephen um, with us many weeks and months in worship, and he is Abigail's father. And so we are excited to have him officially join us today. He has been um, baptized before, so he's coming to transfer his membership. Stephen and I just have two very simple questions for you. Do you believe in God? Yes. Do you believe in God as revealed through Jesus Christ, the one we call Christ and Savior? Yes, I do. On behalf of that confession of faith, I welcome you as a full member of First Christian Church in Macomb. Welcome. <laughs> Stay right here. If you would please turn to your hymnal to page 341. And let us welcome Stephen together as we read. Reaffirming our own faith in Jesus the Christ, we gladly welcome you into this community of faith, enfolding you with our love and committing ourselves to your care. In the power of God's Spirit, let us mutually encourage each other to trust God and strengthen one another to serve others, that Christ's church may in all things stand faithful. We are so glad to welcome you as part of this church. I'm going to have Stephen join the interns and Brandy in the parlor. How about that? So everybody can just go to the same place. Please come forward and welcome him today. And, uh, and to tell the interns thanks for all of their good gifts this year as well. Is it your birthday, Sharon? Well, happy Mother's Day and happy birthday. We're just going to go, though. Is that okay? <laughs> We're going to sing happy birthday to you in our hearts as we exit the sanctuary. If you could stand for the benediction. Go forth from this place being the welcoming people of Christ, being the peaceful and loving people of Christ. Share your gifts with all people and know that you are holy and sacred because you are God's. In the name of the Christ, amen. All right, let's go this way, my friend. How are you guys? Right up the steps, dude. There you go. All right, why don't you stand right here? and let people come by and say hello to you, okay?